Well, uh, this is a treat for, for you, I hope, and definitely for me. This is uh, Noah Van Skyver, a much beloved uh, cartoonist, of, one of our great cartoonists, I think it's safe to say. And I have two books to chat about with him. The recently uh, released Joseph Smith and the Mormons, and then as well as a cartoonist. And I wanted to ask, you know, to begin, um, well, you had just told me before we started that these two books coming out together was not intentional. Is there any, any interesting story behind that? It just sort of just happened? Or? Uh, it was an accident because of the paper shortages or something, like some kind of production thing, like the way that the uh, overseas and the printing, I don't know. Yeah, it's, it was totally an accident. It was supposed to be, um, so I think that Joseph Smith was supposed to come out in May, and then there was delays on that because of the paper shortages. Uh, so when it, so it finally came out in July, and then the same thing happened with as a cartoonist. But I think as a cartoonist was supposed to come out afterwards, mm. and there was some um, some I, I don't know. It's just a, it's not really that interesting. But yeah, basically, the, like I had worked on as a cartoonist, sort of after I'd finished Joseph Smith and the Mormons. Uh, it was just something I was I was kind of piecing together um, in my free time, and I did I wasn't really sure when it was going to come out. I thought maybe it would come out in the fall, but yeah, I don't know. For some reason uh, it came out. I think it's day. great. I think it's great for the uh, the reader, and, and you you always wonder who this theoretical reader is. A lot of people who are completely new to you. So I think this is wonderful that because Joseph Smith is a lot to take in and. So you, if a person, ideally, if they, if they also got as a cartoonist, then they would get a full sense of, of what you do. And uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, go ahead. That's true. Oh, I just think that's a, that's true. That's a, it's a good point. Like you, you have two books that basically will give you a really good idea of my comics um, in general, my style and my interests. Now I wanted to begin with a rather pedestrian question. Can you share with us uh what brought on uh, Joseph Smith? I, I read on the back of the book, it's been like a lifetime project. Yeah, so I was raised in the church. Uh, my parents split up, my mother left the church and she sort of deprogrammed me from it. Um, so I spent my teens and twenties in a kind of a, conf a confused state, not really sure about faith I, I was into like Christopher Hitchens and all like the atheist stuff <laughs> but you know then like in my 30s I started to really reflect on like well uh, do I am I an atheist like is there a place for spirituality and faith and God in my life at all should I go back and really think about this more because it had become kind of a joke like I had taken on this story several times but I wasn't doing it seriously I was doing it kind of like as a, a, a punk rock kind of a irreverent thing. Um, so I had, I had done several attempts at making this, telling the story of Joseph Smith and the founding of the church, uh, but not for the purpose that I wound up going in my 30s when I went back to it, not, not with the same purpose, which had become, all right, let me investigate this. Let me backtrack. Let me see if being pulled out of the church was something that I would have done myself, or if this was something that was taken from me by my mother, um, and let me see if I, if it resonates with me, and I and I feel that I belong there, you know, and I if I could find faith from for that part of my life, you know. I when you say Christopher Hitchens, I immediately think of a uh, Bill Maher as well, because those two are yeah the same oh, kind yeah. of sensibility or um, sentiment. Sentiment. Now, I, I don't. I don't even really know how to tackle the Joseph Smith in a way. I, I don't want to offend anyone. At the same time, I I, I want to ask you, what, what did you struggle with this? Because uh, the, the part of you is like very rebellious. You're not going to take anything from anybody. And at the same time, you want to be well respectful, for lack of a better word, mm -hmm. to the material. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that was. I would just you know, cause the whole book was me just learning what I could about the faith and where it came from straightforward with no, with no opinion. I'm just, I'm just learning and, and writing down and drawing what I'm learning. 
I'm writing down the story. So at the end of this book, I'll, I'll be able to really take in all the information that I've gathered uh, and make a decision about whether or not this faith is for me um, or if my mother's uh, taking me out of the church was actually right for me personally, you know. So the book itself is very straightforward. So if you read it and you don't have an opinion one way or the other, as a reader, you will, by the end of it, have an opinion about the church and it'll be, but it'll be your opinion to make. I, I didn't want to force that on anybody. Um, and I, and hopefully I didn't, hopefully I was successful in that. But I, you know, I don't know. It's definitely a, a balancing act. Uh, as a, as a cartoonist, I, I, I feel like, okay, I'm going to be an, an, a wise guy and, and point out to, to, to know the, the spots where I think there's, there's problems, but I'm not, I'm not being a wise guy, but I, one thing, Let's see. I have so many freaking notes. It's hard to keep up. I'm, I'm really excited to be talking with you. Um, oh. Okay, well, here's one on page 231. Now you've got uh, Joseph Smith alone with the seer stone, and mm -hmm. he's there waiting for uh, a miracle or a message. Now, to me, that's very pro-Joseph Smith, maybe too pro-Joseph Smith, like you're implying that maybe he really was sincere when some people might say there's nothing sincere about him. If you see what I, where I'm going with that. Yeah. Uh, what is the page? Can you show me the page that you're talking uh, about? 231. I don't, uh, I just don't have the book oh. in front of me. At all. <laughs> oh, I, I can, I can get to it. Uh, but, I mean, it is a, it's a balancing act for sure. Cause uh, I mean, yeah. there's, there's certain things that, that you, uh, there's no way to avoid like the, the whole uh, issue of polygamy. Now, now there, there's lots of pages about about you. You touch on it gently uh, mm -hmm. on page two twenty nine, three o three, and then from page three thirty one on to say page three sixty five, somewhere under. It's you talk about it at length. You you get really deep into it, which I think it's yeah. just, it's fascinating because I mean no, no one's going to advocate for polygamy i mean i especially yeah. i mean it's a very very problematic very controversial even for that time period especially for that time period but i think if, if i needed to talk about it i wanted to to show what their how they were reasoning it like how they were yeah. able to put it across to their members of the church and in a way that would make them accept it and uh, go for it you know and it and it maybe it wasn't just like I you know I, gathering up as many women as you could maybe it really maybe for a lot of these people it really was well I mean I think it really was uh, them trying to save each other you know trying to uh, bring people up with them to their their level of heaven and stuff you know yeah it, it, yeah because you don't come out you they kind of leave it up to the reader in certain places. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think you, you kind of lean a little bit into into Joseph Smith getting what he wants, mm -hmm. and, and, but it's left up to interpretation too. So, well, I, I'm not. I gotta, you know, I gotta say, like, I'm not. I didn't do a perfect job with it, like trying to do that balancing act. I know that I that I failed. I failed that in a lot of way in a lot of different examples in the book, uh, because you're learning things that. They, <laughs> some of the things do sound ludicrous to you or, you know, cause you're trying to be empathetic about these people and you're trying to understand like, well, if I'm going to write this character doing this thing, I need to really understand like why they would be doing this. Yeah. But at the same time, it's almost impossible to, to be non-judgmental while doing that sometimes, you know, because the actions are so like odious to me in, in this era or, you know, from in my shoes that I can't help it that it, that those feelings will drift into the drawing or the writing. So I know that, that it's not absolutely straightforward. It is. And I, you know, I've heard um, from people in the church church who feel like I, it, you know, was, was uh, cruel to Joseph and, and to the story and it did a hatchet job and stuff. But then I've heard from other people who think it's fair. So I, I don't really know. Like it really is this book that like, if you, it depends on what you're bringing to it when you're reading it. Oh yeah, sure. I, let me try to do a segue here and be able to show some pages from from the book. Yeah. Uh, let's see how. 
Here we go. Mm. Uh, now, so that's not that's not Joseph. They're looking into the the hat. That's oh, Oliver Caltry. Oh, yeah. No, I, I don't say yeah like uh, like I'm trying to save myself. You're right. I, I my mistake. This, yeah. This book is uh, it's uh, one comment I wanted to make was it's such a big book that uh -huh. uh, it mimics in a way a novel because you can there's things that are embedded in the book that you can't readily get to. I think in a shorter book, a, a short yeah. comic, every word sticks out. But in a big dense book like this. Uh, there's room to put in things that uh, I don't. I don't know. I'm not. I mean, you. I think yeah. you, you know what I'm trying to say. They're, they're I know. Hidden, I know you. Hidden insights. But that yeah. page is is important because it's. I had a storytelling problem there where where Oliver starts his faith is shaken, and I need to figure out how exactly to portray that. And I knew that he had been given the seer stone, which he kept until he passed or you know until he was an older gentleman and he passed it on to the back to the church but i needed to portray that somehow and i felt that a scene like that would be good because it's finally he has this stone that he has faith in and and he can test it out for himself and i think in that page i was able to show that it suddenly strikes him how absurd what he's doing is and it shakes him even more, you know? So that final panel is him going, what the heck? Like what? And so that, and then, you know, and then the next scenes with him are him gathering up his things and leaving, um, you know, after the bank itself fails and everybody's just, you know, a lot of people are splitting and leaving the church. It, I'm, I'm proud of that page. I, you know, I don't think there was no historic document that happened. But to me, it was like that was a storytelling problem. Like, how do I show in just a couple pages him losing his faith and, and leaving when he was one of the founders of the church itself, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, that's a good example right there. Yeah, that's this scene here where he's. Yeah. Scattering I saying, yeah, it's for the camera to pick up because it's, it's it's voice activated. So I'll just keep yammering a little bit. Yeah. So. Uh, As I lose my train of thought. And one of the things that he took when he left, which I wish I would have given some attention there, was he took some of the the manuscript of the original Book of Mormon. He uh, had those pages. Um, I think half of them. And then another half, if I'm not wrong here, but I think it's true, another half they put in the cornerstone of one of the temples um, in like a time capsule. And then when the time capsule was opened, you know, however many years later, 100 years later or something, that the pages had been rotted. They were destroyed by moisture or something that had gotten in there. So the surviving pages that they have now from the manuscript of the Book of Mormon were from the pages that Oliver had taken with him after he left. Hmm. And then there's the other celebrated missing pages, of course. The, the first... The first yeah. The first set of missing pages. Well, uh, now the other thing that, or one of many things, there's no way to cover everything, but we'll, I think this book is a, a beautiful introduction, maybe the only uh, source that a lot of people will turn to for an explanation or an illustration of, of Joseph Smith and the Mormons because people, they move on to other things quickly. If this is the only book, this this is fine. But uh, there's there's still such so much more to to explore because there's there's some places where I, I guess you feel maybe you just touched upon certain things and you, you wish you could maybe expand upon it. Even though this book is what four hundred mm -hmm. or so pages. Yeah, almost five hundred pages, and it's. You know, that page right there that you're showing is uh, another storytelling thing there where it's like, how do I sum up the state of the of that town, the state of the, the of America, like what people some of the people's concerns were like, how do I kind of figure that out? And it's just uh, overhearing these people's conversation and um, 
having Joseph, young Joseph, just paying attention to what people are talking about. And there's a problem that these people are talking about, the question of where Native Americans came from, that he has a unique opportunity to to uh, solve for people, you know. It uh, addresses the issue of, of uh, Joseph Smith's early uh, origins and uh, the well, I don't want to say con man, but a, 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 somebody who of that era who was doing certain. I don't know. Wait, is con con man the right word? Or, or well, it's fine. It's it's fine for me to use. I mean, I felt like a lot of people did call him a con man. A lot of people do call him a con man. So it's just you know using other people's language and other and accusations from that era and stuff. Sure, I mean, it, uh, you know, going around tr trying to treasure hunt for people. I don't think that's a legit business. <laughs> <laughs> so I think well, it's safe to say that they were, con I mean, let's not, we don't have to go as far as saying the Book of Mormon itself was a con, but we can at least say that going around claiming to find treasure for people with a rock and a hat, <laughs> we can say that's a con, can't we? And well, that era, you're right, you have to keep coming back to what was going on in that era. People were more, uh, yeah. willing to disbelieve uh, or willing to believe in the supernatural not that it, a lot hasn't changed up to today i mean there's plenty of yeah. plenty of people who still believe in certain things magical worldview that's what they had yeah well just to jump around a little bit um to do service to the, uh, the other book that's come out as a cartoonist i uh I had a fun time reviewing it for sure, and I, I tried very carefully to, to do justice to it. I, now, here's a page that the, uh, the whole thing with the, the, the great cartoonist. Can you tell us something about your your thoughts on playfully uh, exploring the the world of, of the great cartoonist, especially the 19th century cartoonist? Well, I just thought there was a lot of humor to be mined from the fact that I'm I'm working in a in an art form which is not glorious. Like at one time it was respectable. It was a, a like a mainstream art form, like a really important thing like before films and all this stuff, before photography, it, it was giant. Like it was very, uh, very well respectable. I don't know how to really say it, but basically I just thought that was funny because it's, it's so, it's such, now I feel like comics are the dessert of life. It's not something that's necessary, but it, uh, if you can afford it um, and you're comfortable, <laughs> yeah. then you can enjoy comics. But uh, I but the problem is, you know, there's no money in it. Everybody is is poor. Um, people kind of will get into comics for about ten years and then realize they've wasted their life and then dip, dip out and do other things with their lives. So I just thought it was funny to like just make fun of how uh, how um, pompous a cartoonist could have been back then, like uh, uh, how evil and uh, <laughs> like <laughs> how powerful they could be and stuff, you know. <laughs> like you know, a, a cartoonist invented what Santa Claus looks like to us, you know. It, oh, it was, yeah. They were very important people. Now, have you ever, um, I imagine you have some of the movies that came out that depict cartoonists that, that came out during the cartoonist heyday, like, uh, I can't remember the name of the title, of the, the one with Bob Hope as a cartoonist. And I mean, that was a yeah. rock star status thing. That, that was relatively not that long ago. I mean, the 50s, 60s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love the one with Jack Lemmon. Uh I haven't, I haven't, I've seen bits of the, because the Bob Hope one has Al Cap in it, I think, right? I think so, yeah. I've seen bits of it, um, and then I watched um, Ar Artists and Models, the, is that what it's called, the um, Dean Martin and, and Jerry Lewis one? That's, a, that's like another one that has like a cartoonist in it and stuff, and it's like very yeah. luxurious. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, it's only, it's pretty recently that that uh cartooning has become uh, you know something for the dregs of society <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's unfortunate but it, well, i think it's, it's a lot of first there 
It's interesting that, that that you said now nowadays cartooning is more for a certain niche group that can afford it because you do have to spend the money to to get a nice book like this. And you can certainly get comic yeah. books. Comic books cost too much, I think. Uh, yeah, just just a regular comic book. Uh, but it like used six to be bucks. Where, yeah, it used to be everybody from the janitor to the president was was reading Crazy Cat, and it didn't cost you much of anything. Yeah. Because the comic strips were were uh, comic strips were king. Oh, here's a I, I just this is just so funny. There's so many funny moments. I mean, uh, not to say this is it, the only funny moment, because among so many others, I just happened upon this one where your your brother crashes in on his New York Times reporter, and it not to trash the New York Times, of course, but let's say just a. a Somebody who doesn't really uh, know what comics are about necessarily and bringing up that uh, old uh, saw of the comics, they're not for kids anymore, which we've, we've heard so many, so many times. So he doesn't know. Maybe he's better off just chatting with his brother, although the interview is important, at least for the moment. Yeah. Yeah, but these, these are just so beautifully done. The timing, everything's just. Thank you. So I, I have like a mountain of notes in it and I, I try to freewheel it as well and see what happens as I page through someone's work. So I try to create that uh, that feeling like we're, we're in a bar or a cafe and we're just chatting. Sure. Uh, but. So I, I just wanted to show you. I don't have Fante, Fante Bukowski with me because I only got that as a as a PDF. But I do have okay. some of the other books. I don't have Blamo on me. It's, it's in some 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 box somewhere. But I just love the hype. I just wanted to mention the hype. I believe this is yeah. This is a a, a masterpiece. You said it's, uh, it's self deprecating as cartoonists are. You said this is like uh, somebody was a drunk driver drawing, but. I, I beg to differ. I beg to differ. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. I haven't, you know, I haven't really looked at it, but um, it's okay. I mean, the, you know, it was my very first graphic novel, so it's a triumph for that. I didn't. I don't think I. I think I did a good job for what I could do back then. Well, um, I highly recommend people seek this out. Highly recommend it for what it's worth. I, for what, what my comments are worth. It's uh, can you tell us a little bit about because it's uh, I, I know you've already said so much already over the years, but uh, I uh, I'm just struck by it is such a genius move to to put uh, Abraham Lincoln in a hipster zine type of of comic, and the hypo. <laughs> they, they, were, were you just uh? determined to do something on Abraham Lincoln and you just read this, that. I mean, I, I know this is what's going on. You And you happen to happen upon the hypo and it just, ah, that's, there's, that's such a nugget. I have to do something, but I have to play with that. Um, what happened was I was doing, I had done a story for an issue of Blamo called The Denver Spider-Man which was the first time I'd ever used my comics to try and draw a, a true story. And I liked it. I thought that was really fun. And I wanted to do another story for another, for the next issue of Blamo. And I came across the story of Abraham Lincoln's duel that he had had. And so I was like, Oh, I'll just do a comic on that. That's kind of interesting. But the more I looked into it, the more I saw like what was happening around that era, like how he was battling depression and all these things. And I felt like, Oh, this could just be like a graphic novel. I'd never done a graphic novel before, and I never really felt like I was going to do one. But mm -hmm. uh, the but it just kind of blew, it just like blossomed out into this big thing. Um, so I wanted to do that, and then it did appeal to me the idea of doing a a graphic novel about Abraham Lincoln that looks like a punk rock zine or something. You know, that's just like has like a my weirdo art, but it's like about like a mainstream subject. Um, so I did, I mean, that kind of powered me through it. And then I also really, really badly wanted to have a book published by Fanographics. So that, you know, that, that was it. Like I, I was kind of obsessed with 
being a fan of graphics artist and I'm going to finish this book and then they're going to publish it and stuff. Uh, it, it drove me definitely. Yeah. Well, you follow the model of uh, graphic novelists in a very organic, natural way. You, you create something on a small scale, see, see how it gels and then build on it, maybe do another version and then branch out and make a, a big full on version. Yeah. Now, I have to show folks one dirty tree. And uh, it was nice over eavesdropping on uh, some readers at uh, Elliott Bay not too long ago. And, and the guy said, that's the book. That's the book you should be reading. I, I swear to you. Wow. And, and nice. it's, just, it's fun to hear those, those things, I'm sure. You, yeah. you, never, you never tire of hearing that. Well, I, you know, I just draw all this stuff and then send them out into the world. So it's it's always so interesting that to see anybody interacting with them at all, you know. I'm just yeah. like, oh my gosh, like people are actually reading this stuff. I was reading this one, uh refreshing my read on this one as I was reading as a cartoonist, and they, they both seem to blur into each other like mm -hmm. um I don't know, maybe you uh I'm sure at some point you'll come back and, and do more on, on what was going on in in, in that house. Yeah. Or maybe or is this it? What what do you think? No, I have a lot I have a lot more to say about that that era. Um so I, I do plan on returning to it and I plan on doing like a proper sequel to that, which is just about uh after my parents split and moving to Arizona and the you know, leaving the church and those things, you know, I, I need to I need to do a book about that stuff. So I, it's all I it's in on the horizon. And I just want to show folks one that they may not be aware of, Johnny Appleseed. And I believe mm -hmm. this was uh, what uh, brought you and Paul Buell together. Yeah, good friend of mine. So Paul Buell was aware of the hypo, and he just thought you'd be a natural fit, I imagine, for, for this project. Yeah, and in fact, that book, doing that book is what gave me the the um confidence to to approach the joseph smith book once and for all you know mm. and can you talk a little bit about how these darn things are made because uh i think you had a residency or something to get you in a nice like yato for writers or i guess artists can go to yato as well but some place you could go to be have everything quiet no distractions and you just work on your stuff yeah i had it at the center for cartoon studies in vermont Oh, this one was for the Center of Cartoon Studies, but I think there was some, some other residencies. But in general, what what how do you spend your time? Or I, I don't know where I'm going with this. How can you describe a little bit about just being in a quiet place, working on your stuff? Hmm. Um, well, you know, now I'm a father, so I don't get that much of it. But I used to just spend like nine hours a day sitting in, in here at this desk or um you know, any, any small apartment or something basically. And just, I'm, I'm really not a social person. Like, I'm very happy to just stay indoors and, and draw. Uh, I don't really know. I don't know how, what I really had to say about it. You know, I just, uh, I'm, I'm happy. I'm happiest when I, when the day is over and I have a really nice new page to show for it. Yeah. I, I agree with that. I, these residencies, uh, you, well, you, you were in Europe for some, I, I guess that yeah. was just a, an event, a festival. Well, uh, there was a residency in Europe in a village called Dig Dignac. <laughs> I can't really say it, but they but they bring together a bunch of, they brought together a bunch of artists from around the world to then be together in this like little, uh, this little like farm kind of thing. And we all just collaborated on a book together. Oh, I'm not aware of that one. What's the title of that one? Well, I don't know. I, I don't even have a copy of it. It was oh. kind of silly. It was just like a um, like a narrative corpse. Okay, yeah. And we just did it so that it could be sold at Angoulême. It, it oh. wasn't distributed. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah, well, it, it is. Uh, I don't know what to, I'm trying to think of what to say to, to folks about being a cartoonist because I think there's a lot of misunderstanding. But, but uh, 
I would say from my experience drawing cartoons, because uh, I did many uh, comic strips, and for a point I thought I was going to be a cartoonist, but people kept saying that you're never going to make it as a comic strip artist. It, it, these things work in cycles and blah, 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 and I've done graphic novels. And I think uh, a cartoonist is somebody who prefers to be by themselves, and they prefer to observe, and they call out too much BS sometimes for their own good. And then mm -hmm. you just have to allow the person to maybe get it out of their system. Maybe on the second visit, the next time you meet for coffee, uh, that person will be more uh, <laughs> likable or something. I don't, I don't You're know. an outsider. That's the thing. Like you, you are. You don't feel like you fit in anywhere, uh, which is a curse. Until you realize that what it does really is it helps you be objective about the culture and, and society and stuff because you're on the outside, you're able to like look in and see how stupid things are. <laughs> oh, yeah. that, you know, that's, I don't, I don't fit in anywhere. Like I don't, you know, even with other cartoonists, I don't know who I really fit in with. I just, uh, I'm just, I just kind of am, am here doing my thing. And then when I, I look and observe what's going on in the world and I'm just like, what? Like, everything just seems so crazy. Yeah, yeah. But then you, I think then you find out that there is a lot of, of common ground. Once you're, you're just talking and chatting with people and you get to know them, that a lot of what you're thinking, they're thinking. That's it's, it's so funny. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. And uh, I don't know. Maybe that's. Oh, that's a crazy yeah. book. That's a crazy book to look at. I haven't actually flipped through that book in a long time. That's weird to see those drawings. Oh, yeah. It's, it's a fun book. It's yeah. a fun book. And God, God bless Paul Buell. I, I don't know what you'd like to, to say about him. Uh, he and I have a, a nice, uh, a, a great friendship, too. Uh, and uh, I have a graphic novel that's going to be coming out next year. And it's uh, probably, oh, due okay. to, probably due to him. He didn't actually yeah. write the, the book, but he did a little intro, and he was a great supporter. And uh, so, yeah, you, you meet people along the way. If you keep doing stuff like like I do, interviewing people and writing reviews, and you do it authentically, I, I think it all comes together in the end. Yeah, he's a saint. I love Paul. But I, I don't, uh, I don't know. I think maybe we've covered everything in a short way. I, I want to make sure that. There might, if there's anything you want to add that you think uh, needs to be said, because it's uh, this is a niche audience for sure, and if people are can be jerks and they they don't they watch a little bit and then they go away, or maybe they stay. A lot of people are very sweet and and stay for the to all the way to the very end. Is there something about Joseph Smith and the Mormon Mormons that you'd like to say uh, that uh, needs to be said for for, for potential readers? Well, I don't want people who have nothing to do with religion or don't have anything that they're, you know, I want, I want people to give it a chance, basically, like just to not get scared off by it. Because I, I know uh, religion and Christianity and all that stuff is like very off-putting, but um, it is interesting. And, and this book is in, in a very fascinating piece of like American history. Uh, and I think that you will like it when you actually read it. You'll be very interested in it. Um, that's all. I mean, I just don't want people to get to uh, shy away from it because it looks like a church hymn, hymn, hymnal book or something, you know. Oh, yeah. It, it's definitely something that helps, uh, say, uh, a college student get, get a, uh, another uh, perspective on things. Like I, Killer Angels was the novel that... Uh, I think it's still required reading in American history classes. Yeah. yeah. American history wow. 101. So this could definitely fit into that kind of situation. Yeah. And it's not, you know, it, it, it is an independent project. The church does not approve of it. They did, nobody funded me to do this. It was just like, I need to do this book um, for myself. And I think I'll I'll clarify that more, and maybe a different project in the future. If I if I do do like a sequel to One Dirty Tree, I think I could touch on why I I felt I needed to 
do a book like Joseph Smith and the Mormons. Um, or maybe the reader will understand that when they read the, that book and it, and they see what, uh, what that time in my life was like for me to be deprogrammed and leave a church like that. Um, it was very, it was, it's very jarring, very scary to suddenly be taken off of a path that you were born on, you know, and, uh, to then basically just be out in the wilderness. Uh, that's how it felt. That makes total sense. Yeah. I just on a universal level, uh, it's a great storytelling uh, master masterwork as as a, as a storytelling uh, on a storytelling level, and uh, that's I think that's a good way to to put it. And as a cartoonist, I think that the the whole notion of uh, of a the personality type that would be a cartoonist, the, the peculiarness of of the whole endeavor of, of making comics, and and the person all. all all of that uh, lends itself to, to more and more, uh, like like the um, the moment you're with the space aliens, the Woody Allen esque moment. Yeah, uh -huh. you're, you're wondering what happens next. Well, I, I see a lot more more of this. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Would you you want me to do more stuff like as a cartoonist? Yes, I, I think that d just uh, exploring that uh, that whole uh, theme of the, the peculiarness of being a cartoonist. Yeah. Okay, I can definitely do that. <laughs> um, and I think that you're. I don't know what to say other than. Uh, I think you're in a, in a great place, and of course, we we want to say one, one or two words about the last page. If I can get to it. Oh. The dedication to. Uh, Oh yeah. To your to your son, right? Oh come come on. <laughs> it's a little blurry, but it's okay. But uh that is such a sweet page. Yeah. Every every person I have a lot of fathers write to me about that page because if you're a father, you recognize that moment. Everybody's we've all lived through it. It's, it's an amazing moment in your life, you know. So, I have to ask, and I'm sure the fans are saying, ask him, ask him, what's it like being a, a young dad? How, how are things going for you with fatherhood? Um, you know, I worried a lot about it when my wife was pregnant. And I wasn't sure how to be a father. I didn't know what that was going to be like. But the moments that it came, I jumped right into it. I transformed immediately into a dad. So... Um, it's been easy. I mean, it's been hard because it, it's, it's tough, but being stepping up and being a, a person who can care for a little for your son and you know, or your child or whatever was very natural, very easy transition for me. Um, and I'm very fortunate that uh, as a cartoonist, I'm, I'm awarded the, the time to be uh, present for nearly every hour of my son's life so far. You know, been very lucky about that. I agree. Well, thank you so much, Noah, for, for doing this this conversation. I, I really appreciate it. I, I love everything you do. I love your interviews and just keep going. Thank you very much. It was nice uh, talking to you. Thanks. See you later. Thank you.